When I was growing up in Chattanooga, we had a woods by our house. Now, for me and the two neighbor boys, that was paradise. We had a lot of time, a lot of fun times playing in the woods. We played a lot of army in the woods. There were a few times that I was tied up and left for gone in the woods by the neighbors. We had a great, great time. We had, I was into BMX bikes when I was 14, 13, 14, 15. And uh, we had a great track that we had built in the, in the woods. There was a great ravine and some great jumps. And we used to have races out there. And we just had a really good time playing in those woods as kids. But one of the things that I remember about the woods was as soon as you walked into the woods, right on the left, there was a pathway. Now, if you kept going around, it went out to our bike area. But right to the left, there was a pathway. And the pathway kind of sneaked back into the briars and stuff in the woods. But back as you got back in there, there we had built a fort. Now, don't imagine a big fort, okay? This is a kid fort. We had built this, this lean-to, whatever, of sticks and leaves and branches, and it was a place that you could kind of hide into. And I remember one time being out in the woods there, and it, it, it come up a cloud, as we say. It started raining. And, and I went into the fort, and, it, and I just kind of got into that fort, and it just... I remember it just felt so neat. I was in the fort we had built, and it was raining outside, and I wasn't getting wet. And I loved just being in the fort and looking out and, and watching the rain hit, and it was just a, a great feeling. Most of us, I'm sure probably all of us, like to feel secure, don't we? We like a sense of security. That's why we put money in the bank. That's why we invest or whatever, because we hope that when we retire one day we'll be secure. We like that feeling of security. I would imagine that most of us, I'm just going to ask, I want to wonder, how many of you ever built blanket forts in your house when you were kids? You put blankets up, okay, we got a few, all right, remember those? I I mean, that's another thing. I remember building blanket forts in the house and and putting them on chairs and on things, and, and they were so, I mean, they weren't substantial, anything could knock them down, but as a kid... You just feel really great in that blanket fort because it keeps you away from the mean old adults. The mean old adults are walking around out there, but as a kid, you're in your blanket fort. And we just love that. We love to feel a sense of security. We like to feel like we're protected. We like to feel like we are in, enveloped in something that protects us. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 as we continue to paint this portrait of a disciple. What does a disciple look like? And, and, and what does a disciple do? And we've been building here for the last few weeks the foundations of a disciple because we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks that as Christ followers, we are to minister with confident humility. And as we've been building this foundation with Disciple Man here, We've been noticing a few foundation stones. Two weeks ago, we looked at the fact that we should minister with confident humility because we're chosen by God. Paul says here in the first few verses of uh, of Ephesians that we are chosen by God, that we are called saints, that we've been adopted into God's family. That's just an awesome thought, that we are chosen by Him before the foundations of the world. And then we looked at last week another foundation that should give us confident humility, and that is this, that we're redeemed by the Son. And Paul talks about over and over in this passage, we'll see it again this morning, this phrase, in Him and in Christ. And Paul talks about that we have redemption through the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of our trespasses, verse 7. And Paul talks about the fact that we are in Christ. And last week we kind of put that sheet over and we've cut it out this week. You can see the red outline that we are in Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when God looks at us, he sees us as his children. He sees us as saints and he sees us as individuals who are in Christ, who are redeemed by the Son. But there's a third thing this morning that I want to take a look at. Because you know the reality is we like things in threes. You probably know this saying, three strikes and you're out, okay? Or you'll have somebody, sometimes you'll tell somebody, I'll give you three reasons why you shouldn't do that. Or you've probably heard the old adage of uh, preachers, they would preach three points and a poem. 
We love things in threes. That's just the way we're hardwired. I think it's a reflection of the fact that we're made in the image of God. And in the image of God, you have the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three. You look at our bodies, head, torso, legs. We are in threes. We think in threes. It is that number of, of completeness. And so when we look at the portrait of a disciple, what a disciple is, we see there's a third big foundation here dealing with the Godhead. And what we see is we should minister with confident humility, not because, just because we've been chosen by God, which is enough alone, but also because we've been redeemed by the Son, but also because we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's the third layer, and that's what I want us to focus on this morning. So look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, or chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 13. In Him, in him Jesus Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in him, when you believed, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Now, I just want you to know this morning that you can minister with confident humility if you're a Christ follower because you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Or what is the Holy Spirit? Is, is he just the force? May the force be with you. Is that what we're talking about? Jehovah's Witnesses say he's just an it, a force. Is that what we're talking about? No. Who is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? Jesus, in his teachings on the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16, used the pronoun he to refer to the Holy Spirit. Jesus never called the Holy Spirit an it. He always called the Holy Spirit he. And the reason is, is because the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Third person of the Trinity. And when Jesus taught about what the Holy Spirit does, it is evident that the Holy Spirit does what only a person can do. Jesus said in his teachings of John 14 through 16 that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. That is the operation of a person. And it doesn't convict of sin. But Jesus says the Holy Spirit, he will convict you of sin. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. When he, this Holy Spirit, comes, Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will guide a person along. He said the Holy Spirit will lead the person along. We talk about the Holy Spirit comforting us. You see, the reality is the Holy Spirit is not an it. You are sealed with the third person of the Trinity. And that third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is nothing more, nothing less than God himself. It is the third person of God. And, and you'll see that in Scripture. When you look at the Holy Spirit, you see that he is, Scripture teaches that he is omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. Psalm 139, Ephesians 2, 1 Corinthians 12. When we look at the Holy Spirit in Scripture, we see that He knows everything. We call that omniscience, 1 Corinthians 2. We see that He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent, Romans 8, 11. We see that He is eternal, Hebrews 9, 4. We see the Holy Spirit is active and working in miracles. And we also see something else about the Holy Spirit, actually in the book of Ephesians. I want you to turn over to the last, or not to the last chapter, but chapter 4, in verse 30, I want you to see something else about the Holy Spirit in this book. Paul says, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. Let's just stop right there. Can you grieve an it 